Welcome to another edition of On The Move. This is Chris Blasey, and this is August of 2021. I'm here with my usual co-host, Rich Chekin, and tonight a couple of things that we're going to be talking about are going to be about what's on everyone's mind and really what's underpinning all the markets and driving most people's investment decision. And that's inflation, you know, what's real, what isn't. The Fed, who's basically everyone is hanging on all their words, and the general state of the economy, of course, that what that means for your investment portfolio. We have a special guest as usual, which Rich will introduce to you in a minute or so. But just for those who are new, a little bit about Rich, my co-host. Rich is the Chief Operating Officer as Asset Strategies International out of Rockville, Maryland. Rich has been there and has worked his way up since 1996. So he has a great level of experience in all matters related to precious metals. And a little bit before ASI, Rich was a uh, served in the US military following his graduation from West Point. And he left the military in 1993, I believe, with the rank of captain. So just a couple of years outside of the precious metals industry, and then Rich jumped right in in 1996 and has been doing a fantastic job. A lot of people will know Rich as a author and writer of a newsletter for ASI, which is comes out both monthly and a more alert bulletin on a weekly basis. And worldwide, Rich has been a regular contributor to various workshops and conferences. So Rich, great to be on with you again. Great to be on with you, Chris, as well. Very excited about tonight. We've got a little bit of a curveball, as I think everybody watching knows, uh, but a uh, little bit about you, Chris, for those that, that aren't familiar. Uh, my co-host, Chris Blasey, uh, over 30 years experience in the industry in uh, financial services and uh, technology industries. Uh, he is the founder of Neptune Global uh, and the uh, creator of the patented PMC ounce, precious metals composite ounce, which is a fantastic product, which gives you a blended return in precious metals of all four precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. Uh, you know, Chris uh, has worked with major broker dealers, boutique firms. He's been quoted uh, on various shows. He's been appeared on various shows uh, and in various publications, Wall Street Journal, Investors Business Daily, Market Watch, TheStreet.com, USC Today, MSNBC, and I'm sure the list goes on. He also is the producer uh, and host of the great Reset Opportunity Report. That's his uh, own show where he gets out there and he taps into all the different uh, uh, experts in their fields in the financial services industry and shares their knowledge with you. Chris, welcome, as always. Looking forward to tonight. Thank you, Rich. And uh, tonight we, ha we have a special guest, which was a surprise a week ago. You know, we, we were really looking forward to uh, finally pinning down our longtime friend, uh, Chuck Butler. Uh, who writes the Daily Fennig. We've known him back from the days of Mark Twain Bank and then, of course, Everbank. And uh, when they moved on, he partnered up with the Aiden sisters and he continues to write the Fennig on a daily basis, which we find here at ASI to be required daily reading if you want to have your pulse on, on, on the markets. Uh, and those who read the Fennig uh, will know that Chuck has a friend who's incredibly like-minded, but Chuck had an emergency come up. I think I'll leave it to, to Dennis to touch on that a little bit and maybe give us an update. Uh, but I told him, listen, no problem. I get it. Life happens. Uh, we'll move on uh, with the webinar. You take care of yourself. And anybody that knows Chuck knows that he's a incredible guy. He, he always wants to carry through and follow things through. So when I told him to take care of himself, what he did is he took care of us. And he reached out to his very good friend, Dennis Miller, from Miller on the Money. Uh, fantastic newsletter. If you are not getting it, you need to. There'll be more on that here at the end. Uh, but I suggest that you start reading Miller on the Money if you're not. And you donate to the cause because he does that out of his pocket day after day, year after year. Uh, and the words of wisdom that come through his pages are amazing. Uh, so I'm going to leave it to Dennis because I want him to tell a little bit about his story about why he started writing uh, those financial newsletters. And maybe he can give us an update on Chuck. But I will tell you, we will not miss a beat tonight with Dennis Miller on board. Welcome, Dennis. Well, wow. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Now I have to live up to it, right? <laughs> which is, which will be fun. Um, yeah, I think we should start with the important stuff, and that is Chuck. Uh, 
Uh, I have communicated with Chuck now every day uh, for the last several days. Uh, I was on the phone with him this morning for a good long conversation. Um, Chuck, as the fending readers know, was in uh, Jupiter for vacation with family. Uh, his family came down, and despite having two COVID vaccinations and a flu shot and a pneumonia shot, uh, he ended up in the hospital with COVID and ended up going into pneumonia. And the good news is he was laughing and joking today. He's back in Jupiter. And I said, Chuck, what do you want me to tell the readers and the viewers? He said, tell them I got the greatest care a guy could ever ask for. I'm fine. Uh, the pneumonia seems to have disappeared. He said, Dennis, I can make that breathing machine sing. <laughs> okay. If you've ever had one of those, that's kind of a challenge. And he's planning on going back to St. Louis this weekend. And uh, we'll probably be writing a Fennig uh, after he gets back through his reading stack uh, early next week. So his son's tested positive, but they're cool. They're young and they're okay now and everything is fine. So the good news is Chuck was prepared for, he was on top of it, and he's going to be back in the saddle next week and wanted me to convey that message to the readers. Okay? Great news. Thanks, Dennis. Well, I like Chuck. And I, I'm going to tell, tell a little bit about my history, but I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, I was retired in 2005. I was 65 years old, and I had an investment portfolio. Uh, at the end of the year, we had more money than we did at the beginning of the year. We lived a good life, and everything was working. It wasn't broke. And... I was like a lot of people from my generation. You know, you guys talked about your 30 years experience and you started in 1995 or 96 after you came out of the military. I'm 81 years old. And for the viewers, I'm the young guy here. <laughs> uh, I've been uh, affiliated with this now since uh, 2008. And what happened was on uh, one morning in 2008, I go into my Schwab account and I have all this cash. And where did this money come from? And I'm not joking when I said to my wife, did you win a lottery and not tell me you got all this cash? Well, to shorten the story, I had 70% of our net worth in CDs paying 6%. Didn't have to worry, didn't have to sweat it, could just enjoy life. Literally overnight, they all got called in. So unlike a lot of people, I didn't lose money when they had the first bank bailout, I lost my source of income. And I quickly uh, realized that I started looking for CDs to replace them. The best interest rates I could get was 2%. So take any retiree and cut their income by 66% and you have a problem. And one of them was I realized I had to go back to work and manage my money. So I started subscribing to newsletters and I'm writing to David Beland at Casey Research and saying, you're not getting it. There's this whole segment of baby boomers out there that just had the rug pulled out from under them. And these people need help. Well, David actually published a couple of my letters. And then I got an email from him saying, we want you to start a news newsletter with you being the headline guy. Uh, and we want to take it out because you're right and, and your message needs to be heard. And I said, well, I don't know anything about stocks. I pick them out of newsletters. And no, no, we've got these chartered financial analysts. You tell them what you're looking for. They'll do that. We want you to take your experience and message out to the public. Well, one of the newsletters I read was the Daily Fennet. And... Of course, I love Chuck immediately, as most anybody who would read the Fennig for more than a couple of weeks would. And I got a hold of Chuck at Everbank and said, Chuck, I've got this job offer, but all these people over here at Casey Research, you know, they're writing a economic this and that and these macro trends. And, you know, you're the only guy who writes like I do. Do you think there's a place for me there? Because I kind of like write to read you because I can understand what you're saying and you're not into all that stuff. And truthfully, guys, had Chuck said no, 
I would have turned down the job offer. And Rich, you know, I know you've known him for a long time, but the fact remains is not only did he encourage me, I'm sitting here at 81 years old, and he has become my mentor now and my go-to guy throughout the years. And it was interesting because I was a member of a group called the Romeo Club, Retired Old Men Eating Out. And, you know, we were all freshly retired. And I'll never forget that first breakfast after the 2008 bailout. Uh, guys were scared. And we had three groups and one exception. One group was government employees with government retirement plans. No big deal to them. They knew their money was going to come in like clockwork. The second group were guys that were still heavily invested in the market, trying to milk every last dollar. And a couple of them weren't joking when they said my 401k just turned into a 201k. And they had to take money out every month to pay the bills. And they ended up having to sell stuff at the exact wrong time. And one of them is back to work and has been back to work since 2008. Uh, and then there were guys like me who had the bulk of our investments in fixed income and were looking to find a way to replicate that income without being able to go into the bond market or going into uh, uh, CDs. Well, the one guy that was an exception, and he just had some good advice, he had the bulk of his net worth in non-callable bonds. So his net worth doubled. <laughs> so he did okay, but the rest of us were scared. And so I started writing for Casey Research, then I ended up writing for Market Watch, and they called me a retire mentor. Uh, I was one of the few retired mentors that had actually been retired, the rest of the people's kind of theory. And then Casey Research got sold, and I started Miller on the Money about six years ago. And, you know, people thought I was crazy, but I vowed to keep it free because there is a middle class America out there that have played by the rules. They've worked hard, they saved their money. And as I tell them, we're all money managers now. Now, I don't care if you ran a dry cleaner or a vice president of sales of a big corporation. When you're looking after your 401k program and that's got to last the rest of your life, you got a new job and that's money, money management. You're managing, managing your life savings. So that's my history. Sorry to go along with it. But uh, no, I think it's important that you share that, uh, Dennis. You know, I've, I've long thought, uh, you know, I don't have all the, the statistics to back it up, that there are still today a lot of people that are working that thought they were going to retire back in 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, and I think you just confirmed that there's at least a few of them. I think there's quite a few. Um, and, you know, what you're talking about is very real. Uh, so we're faced with some new challenges in this day and age, you know, in 2021, post COVID, post shutdowns with the Fed doing everything they're doing, we have a very interesting economy. And uh, maybe we can just kick it off and get your thoughts on the, the current state of the economy, where you think it is, where you think it's going, and what does the Fed have at their disposal to steer this ship through these troubled waters? That's a pretty nuclear question. I think there's one more thing I'd like to say. Oh, yeah. real quick. No, it's just like Chuck, I too have dealt with cancer. The good news is that while I had tongue cancer, the cancer's gone. But if you see me hitting a drink cup, it's because I lost my... Uh, salivary glands, and I'll be clearing my throat occasionally, but I just don't let those nuisances bother me. So I'm asking the viewers to be considerate of, of this. Not a problem. You know, the first question you asked about, I think we probably should break it down as to the economy, inflation, and the Fed. I think that was the, the order you asked those questions. Yeah. And, you know, I look at the economy, and recognize I am not the graduate accountant. So I, I do a tremendous amount of reading. And, you know, if you read the Wall Street Journal, happy days are here again. It's like saying gold is up 23 bucks today, so we don't have to worry anymore, right? And I look at this crap, and I mean this daily, you know, everybody has a reason why the market did what it did today. And it's one data point on a large graph, okay? And 
maybe this is a little too much of a common sense approach, but guys, I look at the economy, whether it's growing or it's not growing. And I start with a basic premise. You own a company, okay? When do you build a new factory? When you have the orders to justify it. You build it because it's an investment in your business to grow your business, grow your market share. Maybe you've added new products line, but it's, it is investing in your business. So while they can sit there and say, hey, the economy looks better than it did last year. Well, doggone sure it ought to. Last year sucked, okay? And yeah, you go to the restaurants and yeah, there's more people in the restaurants than there was last year. Well, they're not as afraid of dying. So I would hope that that is back. And what I did was in preparation for this, you know, I look at economy as corporate spending for property, plant, equipment, investing in the future of their business because they see growth. To me, that's the so bottom not, line. So just to clarify, not buying their own stock, right? No, oh, no. I, <laughs> don't get me started on that one. That, <laughs> yeah. You know, and you know what? You, you know who allowed that? The SEC allowed that. That was never a vote by Congress. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, but anyhow, so one of the people I interviewed recently was an economist that I really respect, Dr. Lacey Hunt, they're at Hoisington Management. Uh, he's a Texan, he's a nice guy, and he lives actually in the same neighborhood I did when I lived in Austin. And, you know, when these economists get going and they talk about the deviations and all that, you know, I get a serious place of me go, my eyes glaze over. So I kind of wait till the end and say, okay, tell me what all that stuff means, okay? And in an interview with Rick, uh, Lacey, I asked him, uh, during boom times, companies are building new factories, hiring workers and corporations make profits because they're selling more goods. Since 2008, have we seen real corporate prop, profit increases? Lacey, one sentence, no. After tax profits, when adjusted for inflation in 2020, were unchanged from eight years ago. Lacey, the rate, does, does slow growth mean no real increase in demand for goods? The rate of growth in business fixed investment adjusted for inflation has fallen far below economic norms. In turn, this diminishes the prospect for a normal gain in the standard of living. So that's from an expert. And now I have to go to my eye test because I live here in a suburb of Phoenix and not too far from where I'm living. Hey, guess what? Intel or one of the major chip manufacturers is building a new plant. Isn't this meaning growth? No, they're closing the one in California because they got taxed out of the state. Mm -hmm. So my opinion on the economy, I don't know how you guys feel about it, is uh, I'm going to be with Chuck in Missouri and say, show me. Until I start seeing corporations taking money to invest in their business as opposed to buy back their stock, uh, I'm saying I don't see it. Maybe maybe I missed it, guys. I don't know. I'd be interested in your opinion before we go on to inflation. Yeah, your thoughts, Chris? Well, yeah, a couple things. Um, for decades, this has been going on. We're becoming just a financialized economy, right? Um, I just look at you know coming out of college in the mid '80s, and you know going into the corporate world as an auditor, and I just remember. You used to read the Wall Street Journal back then, and they'd be talking about businesses, mm -hmm. businesses that actually did things, right? They'd be talking about why business is growing. There's only one topic of conversation in all financial publications. It's the Fed and its interest rates, right? So everyone just, you know, and then, of course, to your point before, they just allow things, you know, they've, they've got most people believing that as the stock market performs, that's the barometer of the economy. And then, of course, they, they allow things like stock back by stock buybacks and other forms of manipulation. Plus, you know, we, we know where a lot of the Fed money is going to. And a lot of people, even though their personal situation has been deteriorating, say, well, the stock market's up, so the economy must be good. But I think anyone who does a little bit of due diligence knows it's it's a fraud, right? Um, by all traditional measures to what Dennis was just talking about. There has been no growth at all. So um, I think we're, you know, at least 
I think we're all on the same page with that. Rich, I mean, you want to throw in? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing we're seeing growth in terms of the valuations of their stocks, but it's not backed up by anything real. Uh, we've become a service economy. I believe uh, we all can can agree on that. Um, I am encouraged a little bit, though. I will tell you um, by what can happen in this country if we just get the hell out of the way of companies, right? So you you look at, you know- three, but, that, but that's asking a lot. No, right? I understand. That's politically but, impossible. <laughs> but think about it. Three vaccines, um, basically in the span of about what, nine to 12 months? I mean, that's unbelievable. And they're effective. Uh, we believe they are at this point. Um, they seem to be. Uh, there, there is still incredible, I think, talent, mind power, you know, initiative, et cetera, in this country. I just don't think it's going to the right places. Well, I'm inclined to agree with that. Uh, my, my contention is, you know, you want to talk about tax increases that could be coming and things like that. I'm not going to get off on that political side. I have not given up on America. I think there is a great thing behind American ingenuity and an American spirit, particularly if the government would get the heck out of the way. Uh, it's interesting because John Williams, who we all have great respect for, I, I, he's just a wonderful guy, is one of the probably best economists that uh, I've ever run into. And I did, stats, right? Well, yeah, yeah, shadowstats.com. And uh, John just says, today the economy uh, is on par with the Great Depression. No V-shaped recovery is coming. Okay. So... John, and a lot of times what I do is I'll go to these sources to kind of confirm what I see and I feel. And at least the sources that I've gone to pretty well agree with what Chris said. It, it's an illusion at this point. Uh, that doesn't mean things can't get better. But with the stock market at an all-time high being pumped up by funny money, uh, the next logical question is, well, would you go in and, uh, you know, uh, buy the Dow futures. Heck no, I'm not buying the Dow futures. Show me first and then we'll see. I, yeah, I'd, I rather be a, big I'd rather be in sky. late than wrong. Okay. I think that's a big casino in the sky and people are sitting at home. They don't have to go to work because they're getting paid unemployment, state and federal. Um, yeah. They just got a moratorium. They don't have to pay for the roof over their heads in many yeah. cases. And and I'm 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 not saying this with any sort of you know ounce of compassion, et cetera. I understand this has been a rough year, and some of it was thrust on us by governments, right? Uh, a lot of it was, I think. Um, but you know, people are in a position where you know it's probably more profitable for them as individuals to stay home and not work than it is and to I go to work, that. and that's a big problem. Well, I can tell you a very quick story. We're building a townhouse where my daughter lives, her summer home. And I was there back in May and the drywall people were gonna show up. They didn't show up, they didn't show up. Finally, the contractor called and said, my guys called and said, we don't wanna do this right now. We're getting paid more to stay home. And literally all work stopped for two months because the drywall people didn't want to show up. They didn't have to. So we've all experienced that. I think you talked about inflation. Uh, I've got an article coming out in a couple of weeks. I've been really, really focusing on inflation now for the last month, spent a, a good deal of time in uh, research. And, you know, back when, uh, I ended up buying uh, some Perth Mint certificates from uh, uh, your company. Uh, we thought inflation was going to hit 2008. I mean, it is inevitable. And I talked with Glenn Kirsch at length about it. And we lost the bet. Okay. And so here we are now in 2021, still waiting for this magic inflation uh, that we haven't seen. But I think... The one of the articles I've got is a quoting uh, somebody. I'm not going to look it up now. They're called "The Jig Is Up," and that, Rich, I think today I feel stronger that high inflation is not coming. It's here. Uh, I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago where I took the Volcker inflation years data from the St. Louis Fed, and during that time period. It was up around 14% when Volcker stepped in. And from everything I read, if he hadn't stepped in, 
we'd have had a collapse of the dollar and it would all gone pretty bad. And inflation was about 14%. Well, now we go back to John Williams and John Williams publishes inflation the same way it was calculated during the Volcker years. And you know what? It's the same 14 point something percent. So don't tell me inflation is coming. Go to the damn store, okay? <laughs> I mean, you know, my yard guy knocked on the door earlier this week and he just raised prices 20%. And that goes on and on and on. You know, I keep track of my credit card bills. And fortunately with the throat cancer now being gone, my wife and I are going out for dinner. I just for fun went back and checked what we were spending for dinner at the same restaurants two years ago for today, it's up 30 to 40%. And you cannot fool the public. There's too many people now. Uh, one of them, I think, was Jim Richards, uh, Rickards, uh, who Chris, that you know, and there was another one that talked about inflation. And Lacey Hunt talked about it too. The consumer sees inflation before the government numbers pick it up, okay? And one of the things, I think it was Rickards went on about how the government thinks they have inflation under control, but it's a mindset. It is a psychological issue as much as it is an economic number issue. And that the fact is, once the consumer gets the mindset of, oh my gosh, we better sit down and uh, start spending our money now because it's gonna cost much more down the road, I don't see how the government can control it, okay? Now, before we talk about the Fed, I'd like to give you guys a chance to echo in on that because you- Yeah, what are your thoughts on inflation, that. Chris? Yeah, sure. I just, well, first of all, I'm a believer, and I followed John Williams for many years, right? Because he does tremendous work. I mean, inflation has been understated for a long time, but it wasn't just, it wasn't at the levels right now where now it is so obvious it is so, you know, you can't deny that it doesn't exist. So, mm -hmm. and when you talk about the Fed, you know, the old story of believing your own, you know, nonsense. Yeah. I mean, they've been manipulating statistics for so long, you know, through hedonic adjustments and, you know, that they actually believe that stuff, right? They've lost track that they have put in models to, to measure inflation that is really not capturing the real world inflation Dennis, that you said the average consumer sees long before the Fed does. So, but now it's just so, now what the Fed does is we both know, or all of us know, they say, okay, they concede there's inflation and it's running a little hot, but now the mantra is, well, it's just transitory. It's going to pass. And that's that, that transitory could be a decade, right? And a decade of 10% plus inflation would be disastrous. So, I just think it is, I, I think they've lost control. Um, and I just have to put in one thing about what's different about our economy now. And it's more than just COVID, all right? Yeah, COVID caused a lot of problems, but what we've done in this country with this financialized economy, with the offshoring of all the, you know, the production of, of, goods, and, of goods is we've created a lot of fragility. And, you know, we've had the, in the 2008 crisis and, you know, the, the uh, dot-com collapse, you know, there's been many crises, but anecdotally, you know, during all those crises, you look at the supply chain and you look at the availability of products. They were always there, nothing changed, right? 2008, no matter, you know, the stock market gets hit by 30 plus percent, real estate's collapsing, but you know what? You went to the store, everything was always there. We're, we're like devolving to second world country. The products aren't available. You got to wait for them, you know, and it's not just one or two isolated products. Oh, don't worry. This is going to clear. I give it a good example. I mean, I have a friend who purchased a motorcycle from Honda, from the Honda dealer back in February. He still doesn't have it delivered. And their answer is when we get it, we get it. Right. And that's this pretty fragile system now. Right. And you like, you look at the Ford pickup trucks that are sitting idle because they don't have their computer chip. Right. So all this and this was all let's not kid ourselves. This was all done, not for the good of the country, just so that the publicly traded companies could show earnings 
improved earnings without really growing a business, right? Without really selling more product and better product. So it was, again, that's what I mean by financialized economy. It's this constant financial engineering with all a very short term with absolutely no concern for the long-term health of this economy in this country. So I'll leave it at that, Rich. Yeah, you, you, you raise a good point. So I went to, I'm sure every town has this particular brand of pharmacy in it. I'll just leave it at that. And I went into the local one here in Rockville and all I wanted were my type of razor blades, right? You can't find them. They're not on the shelves. I get a coupon with a mile of tape every time I buy something there. And every one of them says, get this price on an eight count package of Gillette Fusion razor blades, right? Um, and they're not there. Months go by and I can't cash it in because they just don't have them, but they're giving me coupons for them. There were other things that the, stu the shelves just look bare. And when I went up to the counter, I asked the guy, I was like, are you guys going out of business? Uh, I just flat out asked him, are you going out of business? Because it looks like either, you know, you are preparing to liquidate everything or you're really, really bad at inventory management. One or the other. I don't know what the answer is right now, but you're right, Chris. It's, you're, you're, it's different this time, if you will. Um, and the, the price increases are there. I mean, I, I get a, a big cup of coffee on the way to work every morning. And just in the blink of an eye, it went from 250 to 270. Uh, if I get a different cup of coffee, it went from 560 to 590. Um, and that's a significant percentage increase for just a cup of coffee. Um, getting back to what you said, Dennis, I remember going to the Vancouver conference and, you know, we've been wrong for so many years. When's it coming? Yeah. I remember, uh, Bill Bonner, uh, got up and he gave his speech. And when he started off, he goes, listen, for 40 years now, I've been predicting the end of the world. It hasn't happened yet. What the hell are you listening to me for? Um, you, you know, Bill, you, you, you can pull that off, yeah. uh, but yeah. Still read them every single day, right? Um, yeah, I do. Other smart people are coming on board. I saw an interview on, uh, I think it was Kitco with Mark Skousen, where he said, you know, 5%, forget 5% inflation, think 1970s. Uh, I was talking with our good friend Adrian Day, and he's like, listen, you know, we already have inflation here, but what worries me is that there's so much more coming down the pipeline. The wholesale prices are up, producer prices are up. That's inflation that hasn't even worked itself into the system. So given all that backdrop, um, does the Fed, does Chairman Jerome Powell and the Fed have the tools to achieve, what did he call it? Significant forward progress. Now there's a measurable term for you. Well, yeah, he might have the tools, but you know, <laughs> When I, I was a young, when I was a young lad, I spent summers on my grandfather's dairy farm. And when I saw the Fed use the word transitory, I'd have sworn there was a bull in my living room. Okay, give me a break. Uh, transitory, you know, it's like when they said they're targeting two percent inflation, and you know, Chris, you said it could be ten percent for ten years. But they said they're targeting it, but now we're going to make it average. But then they don't tell you how they're going to calculate it. And, you know, you talk about the statistics. John Williams tells a story about back when Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House. He literally went over, and it was documented, to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and said, if you could make our numbers look better, uh, we could find some more budget for your department. And sure enough, now they have the method, well, if the price of steak gets too high, we substitute hamburger and say inflation hasn't gone up. And my question is, well, what do you do when hamburger gets too high? Do you substitute dog food? Okay. I mean, that's not inflation because it's no, not- No, it's veggie food. burgers now, Dennis. It's veggie yeah. burgers. It's oh, uh, I'm sorry. beyond meat or something. <laughs> I, I got that. <laughs> and so the real question to me and, you know, you go back to talking about Rickards. Um, Rickards had something interesting recently that I wrote about where he talked about hyperinflation, where you get the 2,000% in one month. And he said, that's not the problem. He said, you go back to the Weimar Republic, and they had the double-digit inflation, double-digit inflation, double-digit inflation. 
And then finally, the currency became worthless and they morphed into hyperinflation. But he said, when you added up all the inflation from when it started, the currency had already dropped 96%. So you only had 4% to go to nothing. Sounds so, familiar since 1913 here? Uh, yes, exactly. Only a, it was a much more compressed period of time in Germany. Uh, but the fact is that it's the, it's the inflation that we're seeing now. Realize my, my audience is generally baby boomers. And you know, if you retire and you want to make it for 20 years, what are you going to be doing 20 years from now if your life savings is worth 50%, 40%, 30% of the buying power it was when you retire? Now, let's talk about the Fed. I have no respect for the Fed chairman, so I'm going to show a bias right off the top. But I, I wrote an article uh, and I used some of what uh, John Williams had, because what we have to look at is, and, and I had a long conversation with Chuck, I even interviewed him in one of my articles about it, is, Rich, you said, what are the tools that the Fed has? Well, if you go back to the, to the Volcker years, the biggest tool that the Fed had was Volcker himself who looked at his job to truly protect the consumers and keep the currency from blowing up, okay? Now, there's a major, major difference which nobody talks about. And this is where Chuck was very helpful to me. And here's what the difference was. If you go back to the uh, uh, Boker years, the Federal Reserve was still owned by member banks, okay? Now, today, the five, top five banks control half the banking assets. Something around 6,000 other banks get the rest. Well, those are the banks that control the Federal Reserve, okay? Now, in the Volcker years, and my question to Chuck was, when Volcker raised those interest rates to 20%, did banks make more money? And Chuck says, heck yes. They make their money on the spread. So, re, you know, you guys are probably too young to remember when mortgage rates were 20%. And worse yet, you go to sell your home during those Volcker years. As the seller, they were getting points on the front end, the banks were getting mortgage origination fees. And as a seller, you'd pay four and five points to the bank to write them the mortgage so that it could get the payment down with a guy trying to buy your house could afford the payment, okay? And then what Chuck said is when the mortgage rates came down, it's kind of like when all of a sudden the price of, uh, of oil drops, the price per barrel drops, you notice the price at the pump doesn't come down at that same rate. It takes forever for that pump price to get back down. So during the Volcker years, he was serving his master, the member banks, and they were making more money. Now, you take a look at it today, since the repeal of Glass-Steagall, the major banks are now the brokerage houses. Chuck calls them casino banks, and that's an understatement. So now all of a sudden, go back to the uh, taper tantrum that, uh, what was his name, Bernanke had? Mm -hmm. He said, I'm thinking we might raise interest rates a quarter of a point. And the stock market tanked, and the bank said, no, 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 we can't do that. We can't throw that, and you know, the banks have convinced us now that because they're major, major brokerage firms, if they have to make less profit, it's gonna kill the world. So, you know, folk base rates of 20%, now we get a taper tantrum at a quarter of a percent. And to me, one of my articles, I even say it, I'm looking at Powell as the P.T. Barnum, as a sucker born every minute, because he's sitting there pretending to be concerned about, uh, about inflation. And the truth is, they're trying to kick the can down the road to, uh, to the midterm election. But that's also when Powell's term expires. I don't think he wants it all to collapse while he's the Fed chair. Yeah, I, I you know... I don't know if he wants the job. I personally wouldn't want this job. It's a no-win situation, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's a 50-50 a shot. I mean, I don't think uh, uh, President Biden could have had a better 
yes man, uh, you know, for, you know, in his corner, if you will. Um, but there's also a faction that wants to get rid of him because he's part of the prior administration. So, you know, it's 50-50 whether he comes back. And I don't know if he's praying not to come back or praying to come back, but I've been super critical of the Fed. I, I think those that, that read our newsletter know that. Um, yeah. I think all they're <laughs> down to at this point is words. And uh, that's just not enough. You know, when you... <sighs> A couple things. I just want to get them out and then hand it over to you, Chris, and then we probably should move on to, to, to metals because that's a big concern on our, our listeners' minds. But, you know, a couple things. First off, Greenspan. I, I saw him speak uh, at New Orleans Investment Conference. It was kind of a panel interview. And this was kind of, this sent chills down my spine. The Fed was always to be, supposed to be separate, right? Not politically under the thumb, if you will. Mm-hmm. And uh, somebody asked him point blank, said, listen, you're, you're a believer in Ayn Rand. Uh, you believe in Austrian economics. You believe in gold. And why did you do what you did when you were the Fed chairman? And his answer was, you make it sound like I had a choice. Ooh, right? that would scare That sent chills down my spine. So we know that they are politically controlled in some sort or fashion. Uh, then you look at what uh, Chairman Bernanke said, um, somewhere year or two after the, the 0809 collapse, he basically came out and he, he gave the game plan and we're still working this game plan to this day. He said, as long as people feel like they're wealthier, like their 401k is worth more, their home is worth more, if they feel wealthier, they're more willing to go out and spend which is going to give companies the money they need to create jobs and to expand and so forth. Um, so that's the game plan. They don't care that we are wealthier or financially more secure. They just want us to feel that way so consumers can go out and spend. And then you have Chairman Yellen jumps in, she carried on the torch, and now you have Chairman Powell saying things that I think are just meant to befuddle, mystify, and confuse people just to hold on to some sort of shred of confidence in the dollar. And it's just not enough, in my opinion. What, what are your thoughts, Chris? Just two quick bullet points, and then we, we'll jump into the next question, which will affect gold. But at the end of the day, whatever new Fed president comes in, it doesn't matter because we've all just, we know they're just controlled. So, I mean, one may be more dislikable in his dis- delivery. But at the end of the day, their behavior is all the same. Their certain master is the big broker dealer and the bank. They're serving their master. That's exactly it. So, and their master is not the American public. Exactly. And the other thing I will say is the, the other problems with the economy, you know, supply chain breakdowns, fragility because of the outsourcing of all our production, there are no Fed tools that can do anything about that. All the Fed is, is about pumping cheap money, which basically will go into housing or your 401k. And that's it. But at the end of the day, at some point, even if your 401k is elevated, the preponderance or the the, the gravity of the other breakdowns, because a lot of people work in industries that are breaking down because of this fragility, which is now, you know, now we're seeing the manifestation of this, even the 401k being up isn't going to be enough. But not to dwell on it, because I I think we got our point across. The last thing is, and this has been talked about for a long time, the dollar has been devaluing for years, quote, unquote, there's been inflation. You know, when will the dollar lose its reserve currency status, right? As most people should know, but there are actually some people who don't know this. The dollar is backed by nothing but the full faith and credit. So I think people really have to dwell what that means. Faith, that's it. It's not, it's not about, there's no formula that the dollar is backed by maintaining a GDP of this and a ratio of this, right? It is just faith. And really the argument for the last decade is, well, it's, it's the least worse of the fiat currencies, which is true, but I think even, you know, we're moving further along with every other, you know, horrendous uh, fiat currency. But Dennis, and of course, you, Rich, what are your thoughts on the timeline of the U.S. dollar, if it even there is, that it will be dethroned from its reserve currency status? Your thoughts? 
I think you're asking a good question. This is one that Buck and I have gone around and around about. I, I've even interviewed him about that. I think what one of the things that we have to realize is that this is bigger than the United States because when you have these global conferences, you know, it was the old race to the bottom. I mean, everybody wants to make their currency uh, lower price so it helps their export. So the fact is, when we dropped our rates down to well, with more quantitative easing close to zero, what was happening in Europe? They have negative rates. Half the bonds are in negative rates. I fear, this is opinion, that there's a bigger world coordinated effort because currencies are traded in pairs. And if you all are doing the same thing, you're still maintaining parity, but all the currencies of the world are becoming worthless. Now, enter the big bull called China, okay? China is now gone into the fact that it is part of the world currency basket. They are going to be the leaders in something that scares me to death called digital currencies. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote an article recently and the Chinese are uh, dealing with it and they interviewed some woman and she says, oh, I'm willing to give up some of my freedoms like knowing where I spend every dollar having money in my account that if I don't spend, you can tax it right away because you're uh, charging me for not spending. I'm willing to give up some freedom for convenience. And Rich, you want to talk about sending a chill down your spine? I mean, my gosh. So you've got the Chinese now doing it. And along the line with metals, Rich, uh, you guys would be better on the numbers, but from what I understand, both China and Russia no longer hold U.S. debt. That they have converted a lot of the, their holdings in our treasuries into gold and, and silver and metals. So that- And other metals, so the US and other metals. resources and so forth, yeah. Yeah, so the fact remains is, Chris, I think that I can't give you a timeline because I think in your lifetime, the US dollar will still be, and this is opinion, part of the world currency basket. Right. But again, it goes back to what Rich, Rich said, and that is faith, okay? We can't go into the inflation we have now and have a Federal Reserve do nothing about it. I read an article recently where our inflation and Russian inflation are identical. This was just the last two weeks. Russia raised their rates we said not to worry, it's transitory uh, and kept us at virtually zero interest rate. Well, sooner or later, that Russian ruble is going to all of a sudden get a lot more valuable in the eyes of the currency investors. Uh, Chuck has been uh, talking to ruble now for the last four or five years because they've got oil. Okay? I think people laughed at him three, four years ago. They're not oh, they laughed at him. Absolutely. <laughs> but I, I had Russian rubles and some investments. Uh, in Russian rubles, and I didn't lose money on the currency like I did some of the others. So, Chris, to answer your question, I think it's inevitable. And the fact is that the ramifications of the dollar losing the esteem status that we once had uh, are going to be long gone before our percentage of the basket is irrelevant. Yeah, and that's, I, I tend an, to that's an opinion. I tend to agree with you, Dennis. Here. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any currency to include the Chinese yuan, renminbi, whatever, that um, is capable of assuming the role, right? There's nobody near that point. So I think the answer is some sort of a basket. I think it solves a lot of problems for a lot of different people, right? Uh, so for China, I don't know that they want to be the reserve currency. They want they want to have the recognition as a financial power in this world and being part of the basket, I think, achieves that. I think for the U.S., um, it was the reserve currency, is the reserve currency at some point in the future. It may be part of the basket and it may be 80 to 90 percent of that basket, but that's still a 10, 15 percent devaluation of the dollar. Right. Um, so I think that solves some problems for the U.S. and their mismanagement of, of, of the currency. Um, and uh, the uh, I see uh, there's a comment. Uh, Lance says uh, 
letting us know that China has, I think, 1.1 trillion in U.S. treasuries or something like that. Um, so just for what it's worth, I'll, I'll put it out there. But, you know, I, I think the basket is the answer in the future. And I think that change, even that 10, 15, 20 percent change in the dollar's reserve currency status is enough to change our lifestyles here significantly. And I don't think a lot of people are prepared for that. But that's I, what I, I wanted to say to that, that the do, U.S. dollar isn't going away, correct. but it has been devaluing for decades and decades. And um, so the point is, if someone's waiting, saying, well, I'm going to take a position in the sort of assets that will would come through such an event of the collapse of the dollar, well, the dollar doesn't have to disappear. It's just going to continue to its status is going to be diminished. Um, it is, it, it, it's still as a percentage wise, it's gone down slightly in the percentage of, of transactions globally, but of course it's purchasing powers is also going down. And I would just say it because, you know, a lot of people and Rich and Dennis, I'll ask you to talk about, you know, metals because a lot of these countries we're talking about of course, now have been accumulating very significant uh, positions in gold. But um, I also say that, you know, gold is actually, with all its volatility, and of course the press that comes out about it would make you think it really hasn't done anything except go up and down, but not have gone anywhere. And here's one thing you'll never hear. Investors, I entered this, I started my company in 2001, which was actually at the bottom when gold bottomed out from its high 1980, and it began its secular bull run. And gold was at like 270 an ounce. Yeah, 253, I think. My yeah. point is this, from that exact date, gold is up 500%, right? And, but if I say to a person that, they're like, well, yeah, but I still did better in the stock market. The Dow and the S&P on the same date that I measured from the, the bottom of the, of the gold uh, market, they're up 225%. So my point is, you, will, you know, they're constantly faking you out. If people follow the gold market of the other day, there was a flash crash down. It was the usual machinations coming into market, dumping a billion dollars of gold in an illiquid market in Sydney, Australia, right? Before anybody else could even do yeah. anything. Which yeah. no one who's truly liquidating a position would ever do that. But my point is the dollar doesn't have to go away. Gold will go like this, but up, down, up, down, two steps up, one back. And it will continue to do that. And just one last thing I'll say, I always, when people get excited and they get frustrated because they, they've read certain people and are waiting for $5,000 gold. Well, if we get to $5,000 gold, I hope we do that over 15 years or 10 years. I'd like to have a nice 15%, 20% gain per year. But if we wake up one morning and it's $5,000, we'll have huge problems on our hands. Bigger issues, yeah. Having some gold may be nice, but the other problems will way outweigh that. Yeah, Dennis, you have something? Yeah, I want to thank Lance for his comment uh, because I was doing this from memory and it's that kind of comments that help keep me grounded and I really yeah. do appreciate it. Uh, one thing that I think though that I want to get into the gold also was the fact that um, I think that came out of a conversation that I had. I don't remember who with that, that the Chinese are not buying our debt anymore. And that the Fed is buying most of those bonds because they don't want to pay the interest rate. So well, they're not increasing their position in it. They're not increasing it. I thought it was decreasing. I thought they were out of them. But I stand corrected. And, and Lance, thank you. Yeah, they, so, I, from what I understand, they stopped buying. Uh, they have been doing some selling or they're just letting them expire, but they're not accumulating more. Yeah. Uh, just, just saw an interesting question. And I'll use this as my jumping point on precious metals. because. Sure. Uh, I just saw a long comment. I read it uh, from Neil Guerrero. Thanks, Neil, for the question. Uh, basically, he said, listen, you know, if the everybody's saying that, you know, well, if, if the governments can manipulate the metals markets, right, and, uh, and they're telling people it's a bad investment and showing people that it's a bad investment, yet in the background, the central banks are buying it up 
hand over fist, don't you think it's more important that we pay attention to what the Fed is doing as opposed to what they're saying? And I, I absolutely believe that. You know, for years we've been saying, become your own central bank. The hell with what the Fed does. Who yeah. cares what the Eurozone does? Be your own central bank. Take care of your own house and you'll be fine. So I got a comment uh, the other, well, I'll back it up. Three weeks ago, I was in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota for Freedom Fest. There were 2,800 investors there uh, of various shapes, sizes, and, and whatnot. And um, one question, when is gold? when are gold and silver going to do their job in this inflationary environment? So that was the one question. I got a, uh, we sent out a promotion on type two gold eagles uh, the other day. And one of our long-term buyers who has a substantial position in metals, uh, Ron came back to me, he said, enough with the bullish commentary, you guys are embarrassing yourselves. And that to me, I didn't take it personally. I went right back to him, I said, you know what? I know where you're coming from. You're not the only one who's frustrated here. When you know there's inflation, you know there's more on the way, you know we've expanded the money supply by 25%, which by the way, I think is the biggest reason you're gonna see gold prices higher, not because of inflation, but because of the money supply increase. That's where you're gonna see your increase in the price of gold, so to speak. Um, but I know you're frustrated, just have faith. Gold has always done its job. I heard the same negative commentary, negative sentiment about gold when last bull market, when it dropped from 750 to 450, everybody said it's over, done. Then it went to a thousand, dropped back to 750 and everybody said it's done, it's over. It didn't stop till it was at 1921. Then we had you know, the end of the, the market correction of about 45 to 50% to 1050. And we've started building up from there. I heard the same negative sentiment when it sat there for two years at twelve to $1,300 an ounce. Now, a lot of people don't understand why it sat there for two years, but you gotta understand when gold fell from 1921 an ounce in 2011, it was like a hot knife through butter all the way down to twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 an ounce. Okay, that was its first resting point. And guess what? That becomes significant upside resistance for the next bull market. It spent about two years consolidating and testing and trying to break out. And then when it did, it did so with a vengeance. It didn't look back till it was at 1550, retraced, built up higher. We're hearing this negative sentiment now about um, gold and silver not doing their job. And we're five, $600 higher an ounce than we were just two, three years ago. Back then, we saw what was building and we were screaming for people to buy at twelve, thirteen hundred dollars an ounce. Chris, you know, you see every bit of our material coming out. Um, and people were waiting for it to move up and everybody else to start jumping in. And they could have been buying so well at that consolidation phase. Guess what, folks? Here's another one, all right? We haven't hit the 10-year mark. Interest rates aren't high single digits. Your, your Uber driver's not giving you tips on gold and silver. Uh, the gold-silver ratio is still way too high at 74. It's not down to 35 to 50. Um, we're not two to three times the previous gold price. All these indicators, right? There's no political or social stability out there. You can't convince me there is. So all these reasons that gold... Uh, would maybe hit its peak and start coming back have not been achieved. We're in a bull market. You have a great buying opportunity. I suggest you you jump in with both hands, as uh, you know. Uh, many people say in the industry, back up the truck. So, you know, Rick, I, I appreciate. What you, by the way, if anybody is wondering about what this white stripe is, I'm in Arizona and it's monsoon season, <laughs> and I have the blinds open and the sun came out. And well, you're not smoking, so it's you're not a vampire. No, no, okay. no that that is actually the video camera <laughs> on the top <laughs> at the top of the monitor. Rick, I got a different view, and it's probably going to be a little bit untraditional. But I look at gold in in slots and categories. You know, one of the things Chuck Butler and I talked about is what are we going to do? What can we do? And many times Chuck ends with got gold. Okay. Uh, and so we've talked about it, but I have what I call core holdings. Yes. Now, my core holdings I bought 
because I am buying it as insurance. Because Chris, like you say, I'm afraid gold will go not to five thousand, but to fifteen thousand. And if gold, my gold is all of a sudden worth fifteen thousand dollars an ounce, we have some serious, serious problems. And I actually interviewed three guys that were speakers at uh, Casey conference. One was from, I think, uh, Yugoslavia, and one was from Zimbabwe. I forget the other one that actually lived through hyperinflation. Okay, and we asked one of them, knowing what you know now, would you have done anything different? And he said, Yeah. And we said, What? He said, I got out of Jeff Plane, got the hell out of it. Okay, and so. Whether gold is up 23 bucks today or down 50 bucks uh, tomorrow, with my core holdings, I don't care. I flat don't care because that's not why I bought it. It's like buying a fire extinguisher and say, oh, you bought that fire extinguisher a month ago? You could have bought it cheaper if you'd have bought it today, or you can sell it more for, you can sell it, make a profit, you can make five bucks on your fire extinguisher. Yeah, but what if I got a fire? That's why I bought it. So from that standpoint, I hope I never have to sell my gold. Truthfully, uh, I said, you, the, uh, Neil said, do you think gold will reach 5,000? Unfortunately, I think we will see that in my lifetime, and I'm 81 years old. I know dog I, I, know. I would, I would bet you see it in your lifetime. Now, the other side of the coin is, when somebody says it's going to go up, it's going to go down, is now the time to buy. Why are you trying to time the market on gold? And that was your whole argument. And I can tell you the answer to that. I think it was a year or so ago. It might have been back in March of last year. Uh, I think I think silver got down into what eighteen dollars an ounce. Don't don't quote me, but it was really down then. Below that, yeah. Yeah, and. Called my son, and you know, Rich, you're a West Pointer, my son, Naval Academy. <laughs> okay. Thank him for his service. Yeah. I, I only need him one day a year. That's uh, yeah, coming up yeah, in December. So, yeah, exactly. And, but the point being is, I said, here's what you should buy because it is so underpriced. I don't think your downside is nearly as risky as the upside. And truthfully, I bought some metal and I bought uh, silver Wheaton which is a company I know. And not only did I see it go up, I sat there and was writing covered calls all the way. And so when silver got back up to around $30 an ounce, okay, now we'll take some really sweet profits. So that when people are talking to me about the price of gold, my answer is, what are you buying it for? And if you are really buying it for wealth insurance, why are you trying to time the market? See, and see, I, don't sell I think, gold. I mean, that's I just think you have to do some soul searching here, though, because for years, I mean, you know, our business was based on selling gold as insurance, right? So, I'm gonna shut this blind. Go ahead. I'm listening. Yeah. So I had, I had a, a client come up to me in 2012 13 uh, at a conference, and he said, Rich, you let me down. Uh, and I said, why? He goes, well, you never told me when to sell. And I'm like, well, if you're buying it for wealth insurance, you never do sell unless you have a financial crisis and then you sell it in a heartbeat, meet the financial need and replenish that allocation as quickly as you can thereafter. He said, well, I was buying for profit. And I'm like, you got to tell me that. So what it dawned on me is this. I don't it's not that I don't believe my customers, but no matter what they say initially, I dig deeper because if they say they're buying it for wealth insurance, I know there is some piece of them that wants it to be profitable. So they have to figure out what part of that is for profit and what part of that is for wealth insurance. And I, I deal with them different ways. Wealth insurance, think, I'm like you. I never sell it. But I think you have to also, I'll give you an analogy. And that is, I believe in stop losses. Hmm. In other words, my point of having a stop loss is to prevent a catastrophic loss. Yeah. So I'll set a stop loss. Well, there are a certain number of people who purport to believe in stop losses, but I have certain holdings that I don't have stop losses on because I believe in their industry and what they're in. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, they get stopped out and they say, well, what if it comes back? Well, 
the stop loss did its job. It prevented a catastrophic loss. I had EMC. I saw it go up to 104. Then it dropped to 80. My broker calls and said, do you want to sell it? Well, it's got to come back. And well, then it dropped to 50. Well, it can't go any lower than that. The hell it can't. It got down to four. So the point being is, while they say it, they're thinking logically. Rich, you, you really have to test the metal because emotionally, seeing your goal down and, oh, my God, it's down, you know, and it's down $10,000, emotionally, you have to deal with that. Where I saw what you outlined was at Casey Research because they were promoting junior mining stocks. And they were dealing with investors who were trying to get rich overnight. And they really felt like that. Clearly uh, a profit motive. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a whole different story. But to me, I'm not worried about the price of gold. The government can manipulate it. But just like the Fed, it's eventually going to get out of control, in my I, opinion. I just have to say one thing about the price manipulation, mm -hmm. because I agree 100%. I've been doing this 20 years. We've seen this, the, the takedown. It's always the same playbook, Draw, you know, dumping contracts in, in illiquid time. But just imagine what really, what this means, what's going on behind the scenes. With all the manipulation, Don't with open up. all the media talking gold down, I'll go back to what I said before. From 2001 to today, gold is up five, well, actually it's over 500%, and the Dow and S&P, 220. Mm -hmm. The point is, there's a flip side to it. It's actually been a gift because it's actually been performing great. You may not like it because there's days when the swings are wild and it's gut wrenching. But at the end of the day, there you're allowed to accumulate gold at a good at a better price than where it really should be. And I agree, it will be five thousand definitely in your lifetime, Dennis. Because I really don't think it's that many that that far off. And then it'll go beyond that, right? Because it's not going to stop there because that is just a sign that a lot of the breakdown and the uh, the loss of stature of the dollar is in motion. And motion like that isn't going to stop. And it's got, not going to stop the goals at a much higher price, in, in my opinion. I, I agree with you. I want, if I could, Dennis, I just want to give an example. So um, the, the one I use for, for gold is I believe we measure things, we measure value the wrong way we measure it with a flawed measuring device, right? So if I wanna measure my desk, I take a 12 inch ruler and I measure it and I say, okay, my desk is uh, five feet long, okay? Um, if the next day I cut an inch off that 12 inch ruler and I measure it again, I get a bigger number. Did my desk grow? No, no of course not. right. It stopped growing long ago when we chopped it out, you know, chopped the tree down. Um, but the measuring device is flawed, and that's the problem. We're measuring it with mismanaged fiat, a flawed measure of value. If you want to get a true measure of value, you measure everything in gold. It is our true measure of value store of purchasing power over time. So, um, yeah. Dennis, you, you had a thought. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, well, I'll be very short with it, though. One of the things that I talk to my readers about is, you know, when you're talking about building a retirement portfolio and what is successful retirement, uh, successful retirement to me is a simple definition, okay? You can retire at a reasonably comfortable lifestyle without constantly having to worry about money. Mm -hmm. And as you build that retirement plan, you've got to deal with how much should I have in metals in that core holding? Well, unfortunately, well, we can say 10 to 20%. A lot of it depends on how much income they need and how big the portfolio is. If they can take their other 80% and generate enough money so that they don't have to change their lifestyle. But even with that, once you get to that age of retirement and you guys aren't there where you've lost your primary source of income and can never go back to it, as a retiree, you have to deal with those emotional fears and keep them in perspective if you're going to enjoy life. 
It is without constantly having to worry about money. But it's not worrying about money today. I'm worried about money when I'm 95 and hopefully I still have it uh, because I can deal with it today. But if you take inflation in, where am I going to be in 15 years with the dollar going down now? And you've got to deal with that emotional side. Uh, we, have a, we have a question. And I think it's a good time to move on to questions. Uh, I saw yeah, a question so there too. from Robert. Uh, yeah. So Robert uh, asks, you know, with the advent of central bank digital currencies, uh, at, you know, in China and elsewhere, I think every government is scrambling to introduce them. You know, what do you see as the impact on precious metals uh, with central bank digital currencies? And I have some clear thoughts. I'm all over the internet after uh, uh, Freedom Fest. I, I, uh, I said it on a panel, we were on a Bitcoin versus gold panel, that question came up. I also said it on a Kitco interview and it started running around the internet. My, my quote was central bank digital currencies were concocted in hell by Satan himself. So I apologize that I didn't take a strong enough stance on that. Uh, <laughs> maybe I wasn't clear that I'm not in favor of central bank digital currencies, but you know, I, I love the idea of decentralized cryptocurrencies. I don't know what their future is. They're young. They're figuring themselves out. We'll find out what they're going to be when they grow up someday. But I love that concept. I love the free market solution to fiat currency. I think it's better than any centralized government solution. Um, the government solution, do not be confused. It is not decentralized. It is a more efficient delivery mechanism of the exact same garbage we have in circulation right now, okay? But with some added twists, they will have total control of all your finances and you will lose all privacy and freedom, okay? I think they are pure evil. Again, sorry if I'm not clear enough and taking a strong enough stance. Um, but I think what happens if they, if they do come into being and the governments do force them down our throats. Uh, I, I've seen over time that when, when traditional markets fail us, black markets will always emerge. I think if central bank digital currencies become the norm, that I think that will help Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as alternative means of currency. And I do believe that gold and silver become your new cash. I'd like to interrupt real quick. We just got an interesting question to me about mm -hmm. managing trapped capital in a 401k. I'd like to ask that person to type in what they define as trapped capital in a 401k um, so that I, we can answer that uh, effectively. Uh, Rich, can I address what you just said? Because yeah, I, think absolutely. I, think, I think you're understating. Did you see the, the, that bill passed the Senate yesterday? Yes. Did, did you know part of that bill is a tax based on the amount of mileage that you drive? I didn't think we were allowed to, to find out what's in it yet. We had a, a uh, first, oh, right? Well, Isn't that maybe, how that works? Maybe, so my, maybe it my source wasn't accurate. <laughs> but the fact remains is there is, I better say theoretically, my, my source said to me, basically what, you're, what, you, what this is, is it is not really, and by the way, this is on top of gas tax. If they wanted to, if they wanted to cut the amount of uh, drive, uh, you're driving down, uh, you know, the, the green movement, all they have to do is raise the tax at the pump. But instead, they are going to tax you on the amount of miles you drive. But the point is, think about what it really is. It has nothing to do with tax revenue. Yeah. You now have Big Brother to tracking your vehicle Okay, along with the insurance companies, mm -hmm. so that you have lost total privacy. They know where you are, where you've been, how long you were there, and how fast you're driving, so that yeah. maybe you'll get a federal traffic ticket for exceeding the speed limit on an interstate highway. Okay, and to me, it has nothing to do with cutting down on your driving and tax revenue. And it is so analogous to what you just said. It is the government now having total control and taking away citizens' rights and privacy. Okay. 
And the government's not going to allow Bitcoin. I, I am not a Bitcoin believer because they don't want competition to the official currency. So that if we get ourselves in some sort of a digital currency, uh, I think we're going to find there may be other ways for barter, but the government's going to try to make them illegal uh, because they don't They're want They're already trying. Yeah. They're yeah. already trying. So I, I, I think they were slow to act because it's kind of like a gnat on the windshield. It really didn't have an impact. It wasn't affecting anything. If it becomes significant, and I think it's starting to, I mean, you have major institutions adopting uh, those positions, et cetera. Uh, you, know, you have more and more uh, vendors that are considering using them. It's still not being used as a currency. It's used strictly, in my opinion, as a speculation right now. Um, if it turns the corner, I think the government will get more involved and the purists say they can't, um, we'll see. Uh, you know, they, uh, Glenn, Glenn uh, Kirsch always used to say the government has all the time in the world and all your money to fight you with. Mm -hmm. um, so. well, yeah, I, hey, look, I concur. And not to get people who are Bitcoin advocates upset, it is a speculative investment, it's not money. And it's not money because if I look at the few places that accept Bitcoin, they charge you more because of the conversion cost. Once they receive it, they got to convert it to dollars, right? Mm -hmm. It's just not a currency right now. And having been in the tech world for 12 years, you do not know the compute power and the capabilities that the government has, all because a person with their desktop computer can't you know, hack a Bitcoin. That doesn't mean anything. And also there was a nice, remember Colonial Pipeline about a month and a half ago? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, pipeline got hacked. They paid in Bitcoin, they paid the ransom. And a couple of days later, the FBI retrieved it, pulled it all back. Now, I was told I was told by Bitcoin purists that that only happened because the guy was incredibly stupid. He uh, left his so, cell phone behind right. with all his codes on it or something. Well, that, that's so, the so. problem when an investor is too emotionally attached to something. Yeah, that they're going to keep coming up and rationalizing and say, well, it was, this was a one off. That was a one off. But the bottom line is they can just, you know, they, anything that moves on the Internet. I don't care whether it's an encrypted packet of information. You know, if it's traveling on the internet, it can be tracked and they can just threaten you with all sorts of different threats if you transact in it. So the idea that governments are powerless to it, uh, that, you know, that's an argument that is I, I, I can't accept, unfortunately, because I've not seen that to be the truth at all. And where we're going, it's all about centralized control. To mm -hmm. Den's point, you look at this legislation, you see the things they want to put in your car about sensors in your car, seeing if your head is nodding. And you know, you get people like, well, this is great. This way you'll be alerted if you're falling asleep. These are Trojan horses. We and the best thing in the world is a digital currency. You know, back in 2004, you know how the Fed, several years after their meetings, they released the Fed minutes. They become public. It's called transparency. Just yeah, but it's years years. after they do it. But very few yeah. people go and read the minutiae. The delayed fuse, yeah. I remember, because I'll never forget it, Fed minutes from several years earlier, it was like 2001 or two, the Fed was talking about how to create a time value on money. Okay, so this has been in their game plan for years. They just needed the technology to do it. So... If anyone doesn't know what that means, the time value of money is to make you a forced consumer. You get paid, we'll say $1 digital. You, it has a value of a dollar purchasing power for the next 30 days. If you don't spend it, it drops to 90%. It's like a half-life of a radio isotope. Yeah, no, actually, that was, in, that was in the Chinese. Exactly. Uh, that they're doing it right now. Exactly. exactly. So it's, this is all, you know, anyone who says, oh, but it's going to be convenient. You know, it's a, it's you're completely mistaken. You are. They can cut you off if you're politically out of favor, right? If you're with a group that they don't like. So see, you, see that's my point, Chris. If if imagine, you know, nowadays if you get canceled on Facebook, big deal. All right, you just yeah. don't you don't post on Facebook. Who cares? Um, imagine getting canceled from your bank account. Yeah, and that's a whole different uh, ball of wax. Yeah. And just lastly, I'll just say, as far as gold, what that will do is as we move closer to that, the people that understand what that means, that they will have absolute control of nothing. The last refuge, as 
money will be precious metals. You know, no something that's tangible they can take. You know, they're going to hope hope that this draconian centralized control will will eventually collapse. And then when it all collapses, that they're going to have something that's tangible, real, and of value, and they can build their life from it. But and, you know, whether it's done in the in the black market, as you say, but it will benefit the metals, right? Um, definitely for the people that understand, it's your last opportunity to have actual money. I know, Dennis, you have something to add. And then I also saw that the one gentleman uh, or lady yeah. added. Yeah, I, I want to answer those questions, but I, I can't let this one pass. <laughs> I, on my Miller on the Money, I have a Miller on the Money Facebook page. And I put one quote a day in there, or one post a day. And that is, I post a quote, quote of the day. Today's quote, quote, vote for me. I'll use my office to take another American's money and give it to you, Walter E. Williams. And I thought, you know what, just for fun, I'm going to see what happens. And you can boost your post so that more people look at it. So I say, Facebook, take 25 bucks and see how many people like my quote. Within two minutes, they deleted it and rejected it because it violated their Facebook's policy. Okay. And it, I mean, it's a nonpartisan quote. So, you know, no, we but don't you're know not. Where it's you're not allowed yeah. to insult the political class. You yeah, but and this is right, both, both parties. Go ahead. <laughs> In any event, let's let's get into the question. But when you said that about Facebook, uh, it, it doesn't literally happen today. Um, Dennis, I just I'll add to that. I I have been canceled from Facebook. Oh, and I I've never too. even used it. Somebody <laughs> set it up for me so we could like my company's web page. I never posted on it, and I can't get in. I've been canceled. Yeah, I, I, don't know why. I, I, I had to work around that. I published an article and they, they kicked me off. Okay, uh, I think you want me to address some of these questions. Yeah. Uh, this is Paulette. She asked an interesting question. And Paulette, this is all opinion. You know, I'm not one of these guys that's a licensed financial planner and whatever. But this one really hit the sweet spot with me. It says, if you're 77 years old and still working, would you consider retiring now or hold off a bit? I flunked retirement the first time. And while I was enjoying life at 68 years old, okay, I now write a free newsletter because what else have I got to do that feels like I'm contributing? Is that when people talk to me about retirement, they, I have to tell them it, you gotta look at it differently. You might be leaving your full-time job, but don't quit being productive. And if that production earns you some income, that's even better. So for me to answer your question, Paul, that I'd have to say, how much do you love what you do? Can you do it part-time? Is there an encore career that might be tied in with your hobby that you can do that generates income? Because boredom is the enemy of the retiree. And I'll give you one quick example. Uh, I wrote an article years ago on Encore Careers, and I've never forgotten this one reader that wrote in, and that both he and his wife had full-time jobs, and they got tired of it, and they retired, but they like to fly. So their Encore career is they deliver airplanes that have been sold around the world, and so... The guy wrote, he says, right now I'm in a hotel room in the Bahamas. I had just delivered a plane. They pay my expenses. So we decided we'd hang out for a couple of days before we went home. So to answer your question is stay productive as long as you can. You'll live longer. You'll live healthier, both emotionally and financially if you do. Great advice. So, well, that's a good question. And you are qualified to give that advice, Dennis, I will tell you. I don't know. I, I know this, that even the, I mean, I've got a friend of mine now that cleans balls for the golf course and they resell them as partly used. And his contention is now I can play golf. I don't have to pay for it. And I've lost happy. some of those balls. Oh, yes. You've contributed to his inventory. Exactly. <laughs> uh, 
And the anonymous attendee talks about trapped capital. And this is one I have an opinion on, but probably would line up with what you said. And then talking about living out of the country, and I have friends from Casey who live in Argentina. And, you know, Doug Casey says you live in one place, have your money in another place, and are a citizen of a third country, and you might have a chance of being treated well. And one of them in Argentina goes to uh, a neighboring country and, you know, they can transfer their, their money and currencies uh, much more than the official rate. It, but he's talking about, I have gold and silver in my hands, uh, whereas in a 401k, you can only invest in equity uh, and financial products. I don't think that's true anymore. I have my IRA, and by the way, I'm a strong believer in Roth. Get rid of your good business partner, the governor's uh, government, as quickly as you can. So I have the major portion of my Roth IRA in Switzerland, okay? And they can pretty well invest it in anything that I tell them to. And we own some gold mining stocks, not in junior miners that are looking for gold. Uh, the the solid mining stocks are like the pharmaceutical business. They don't have R&D anymore. They buy companies after they uh, have already got proven reserves and they bring it to market. So then I think that there are still options available in metals that you guys could probably talk about for another hour. But there are ways you can burn that candle at both ends, even if it's only mining stocks that pay small dividends. Uh, I'll leave the rest of them up to you guys. Uh, only thing I would add to that is, you know, I understand your your uh, desire to have something real invested in your retirement portfolio. Um, you can, in certain 401s, hold, you know, precious metals and other real assets. You can do it in an IRA, but the the consult your financial planner. I'm not a financial planner either, but I do know that it can be done. What matters is. Uh, will the administrator administer those assets in their portfolio, right? Um, and not all of them will. And, and, and not all of it is because they can't. It's because they don't want to take the time to learn how to do it. Um, I've always been told that if you're going to leave a company or if you have some sort of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, event that allows you to roll your qualified plan into an IRA, um, in most cases, advisors will suggest that you do that because it gives you a lot more yeah, flexibility and a lot more variety of the products you can hold. You can hold foreign real estate in your IRA, but you may not be able to do it in your 401k. If you have some sort of pension plan dictated by others, you're stuck in equities until you leave the firm, have a change of the administrator or whatever the case might be. Well, I, I have to add to that too, though, because this goes back to my Romeo buddies. When we started talking about inflation, a lot of them went back to their old pal, Charlie, who's been their stockbroker for years and years and years, and say, well, what are you doing to protect me against inflation? And they say, well, we got you in tips. I'm not going to get into treasury infected, uh, inflation protected securities other than to say they don't protect your portfolio against inflation. And you talk to them about gold and silver, well, they can't make commissions on that. And so you, if you take it as a self-directed, you're going to have to align yourself and educate your broker to do it your way yep. uh, or make the trade yourself. Yep. So I, I, I will tell you, I think we've answered all the questions. We got some thank yous from Paulette. Uh, she got a little bit further information there about their experience in 2000. Uh, but I think it's a good point to, to move on unless there are more questions. I hate to hang up when we have more questions, but I don't see any more questions. So I, I'd like to just let everybody take a shot uh, going around and you know give us your parting thoughts and also tell our folks how they can find you. We'll start with uh, you, Chris, and then Dennis, and then I'll finish up. But I wanna say a little bit more about Dennis before I go as well. So Chris. Sure. Well, first I wanna thank our attendees for coming on. We really appreciate it. And uh, Dennis, it was great spending the evening with you. Um, Rich, again, it's always fun. Um, look, we're in, we're in some very crazy times. Um, I think systems and uh, institutions are broken. And, uh, you know, I think, 
following folks like Dennis is a big help for our readers. And, you know, he does have a free newsletter. So um, I'd encourage you to, to reach out and sign up for that. And look, you know, we, we look at it from the metal side. You know, I got into this, into this business because I believed in the beginning of the turn of the millennium that we were going into a secular bull market for the metals. It's turned out to be correct. Um, the timing, as far as the metals hitting prices that some people were expecting because of the deterioration of, um, of our systems and policies and, and the machinations of the Fed, hasn't satisfied a lot of people yet, even though it's done a good job. But my point is the trend is still in place. The momentum is building. And for that part of your portfolio that I think I can hopefully speak to with, with some help, you know, do not be discouraged. It is an opportunity to really to build and get to the right place as far as, you know, how much you should have. And when I'll just say one last thing, people, one thing a person always asks is how much of it should be in my portfolio? And my answer is this, look, everyone has to do their own due diligence, right? You never go all in on one thing, but it also has to be at least material enough that if it's being used as a hedge versus other assets in your investment, that is, at least it's going to have some impact. Meaning, I had one person tell me many years ago that, you know, basically I calculated how much they had versus their total portfolio, and it was like 1%. Well, that's nice, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's not going to do that much for you. So you never go all in, but just make sure you have a, um, you know, a reasonable, healthy position for what's coming down the pike. All right. Thanks, Chris. And how can fi folks find you? How can folks find you? Uh, yeah. So you can visit us at neptuneglobal.com. That's neptuneglobal.com. You know, I encourage you to come visit our site and, um, and learn more about us. And you can obviously click on, if you have any questions, submit it through our contact page, and we'd be happy to uh, assist you um, any way we can. We're big believers in the program. You can you can buy PMC ounces through us as well. We we love Chris uh, since uh, Jim and his daughter uh, Jim Rickards and his daughter introduced us many years ago. Uh, Dennis, parting parting shots and how people yeah, can uh, find you. Yeah, a couple of things. One thing I think I want to make clear to all the viewers is I have absolutely no financial arrangement with either one of these folks. Uh, so that I was asked to come in and. Uh, Chuck suggested it. I, I had fun tonight. Um, and it's interesting because I too agree with Chris. Everybody's allocation to gold is different. And again, it goes back to what is your core holdings, meaning your wealth insurance versus investing for profit. Uh, and I did read something recently that you guys might like. I don't know if you read Richard May Mayberry. Uh, and now all of a sudden his publication is escaping me. But he talks about- Early warning. Early warning report, thank you. I think I've met him, he's a wonderful guy. But the fact is that he wrote last month about having 15 to 20%. And he is one that, he's not an alarmist type of guy. He actually worked in the CIA. And he said, if you've got 20% of your holding in gold, if what I think has got a 90% probability of happening, that 20% will cover the rest of uh, your losses elsewhere. And that's the first time I've ever seen somebody who I respect say something that extreme, okay? Uh, as far as uh, Miller on the Money, I realized, Chris, maybe I should get a backdrop that said MillerOnTheMoney.com, <laughs> okay? I do this because I love it. Uh, it's free, you can go to my website, sign up in the upper right-hand corner. Or, uh, Rich may have some stuff there. Uh, and I live for feedback from my readers. You know, Paulette, you made my night, I'll tell you. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that my readers write in, and I've got a dialogue going with many of them that are now regular correspondents. Uh, you know, I took the job of retire mentor seriously. Uh, and you know what? I'm 81 years old. So far, I'm a cancer survivor. Uh, the ability to feel like I can still contribute is what I look for. So... Thank you all for watching and uh, Rich and Chris, thank you for providing the opportunity. And the good news is Chuck will be back in the saddle next week. 
I was just going to say our thoughts and prayers are with Chuck. I, I can't wait to start reading the Fennig again, uh, but not a second before you're ready, Chuck. When you're ready, we're ready for you. Um, and thank you for the suggestion and the introduction to get Dennis uh, talking with us tonight. As I said at the start, I don't think I lied or misled anybody. We did not miss a beat uh, with Dennis. I will tell you, I've been reading his newsletter for some time. It was introduced to me by Chuck and several other folks that we know in, in this world. Uh, and uh, I, I appreciate the common sense approach. If you're not a subscriber, absolutely go to Miller on the Money, sign up. And I will tell you, he does great work. He does a lot of research. He doesn't have to do this. He does it for free. Uh, and what keeps it going is the donations, right? It's right there at the bottom of the newsletter. Uh, I suggest you donate. Um, I can't make you, uh, but I strongly encourage you to consider it. We will be following up this webinar like we always do. Uh, and we're gonna go out to all of the attendees, but also to all of the registrants uh, with the full copy. We'll try to get this out sometime early tomorrow. And in that email that you get, you're going to have the way to contact each and every one of us to include uh, Dennis's newsletter. Please visit it. You will not be disappointed. My parting shot is what I said about the, the medals guy that called in and is losing heart. Um, there's no reason to. Uh, for millennia, gold has done its job. There's no reason to think that this time is different and it's not going to do its job. I think it's going to do its job now more than ever. Uh, and, you know, in the short term, you know, gold has never really uh, reacted to short term movements, this, that, the other, uh, except when they're thrust upon it, you know, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, flash crashes and four trillion or four billion dollars sold before the open, that type of stuff. Uh, but like Chris said, given all of that, given all the headwinds, gold is still moving up. And for the first 20 years of this uh, uh, um, cent century, it's outperformed all the other equities indexes. All right. So trust in gold, take the opportunity to buy well, buy it for the right reasons. Uh, the first question you get when you call us is, why are you buying gold? Uh, somebody had a question about, you know, what's the difference between precious metals and numismatics and how much do you allocate when do you buy numismatics? That's different for everybody. That'll come out of a conversation if you call us. Um, you know, you'd be surprised. The, the old adage is, you know, if you're, if you're really old, you don't buy numismatics. Well, we have some really old clients that are buying numismatics because their idea is to transfer wealth generationally to their kids. It's a great investment for that. You got to have a conversation, figure out what your goals and objectives are, and we can help you get there. Um, I tend to look at bullion first and always, uh, and then I look at numismatics second. Uh, but I have both, and I think they both serve a purpose in the portfolio. So I want to thank everybody for sticking around with us. We went a little bit longer tonight. I kind of had a feeling we would, uh, but I don't think there was a dull moment. And Dennis, I can't wait, hopefully in the future, to have you back again at some time and maybe have you contribute to our newsletters and so forth. Um, and uh, I really hope we can get Chuck back in the saddle and get him back on here as well, because uh, I think everybody would benefit from that as well. And Chris, always a pleasure. Uh, I thank you all for tuning in and we'll be in touch tomorrow with an email. Thank you. Thank you.